Welcome back, oceanographers. Today we're going to cover module number four in our oceanography lecture series. We're going to look at ocean dynamics, the air and sea interaction. We're going to be discussing global wind patterns, how they move around weather. We're going to talk about ocean currents. They are moved, the surface currents at least, are moved by these global winds the effects of the ocean on world climate and weather. We're going to look at waves. The three types of waves are wind, seismic sea waves, and tides. And then we're going to look at the ocean and how it affects coastlines. Taking a look at the atmosphere, it is the layer of gases. And by layer, let's, let's be clear, the lowest layer is called the troposphere. That's where we live. The layer above that is the stratosphere. And then we have uh, upper layers, ionosphere, magnetosphere. We're really only talking about the troposphere because that's what comes in contact with the ocean. So when we talk about weather, the global wind patterns, things along those lines, we're concentrating on the troposphere, this lower layer of the atmosphere. It's a nitrogen-oxygen mixture with some traces, and it varies from place to place. Obviously, here in the Gulf Coast, where I live, uh, there's more water vapor because of the warm air and ample water provided by the Gulf. If you were to, say, go uh, to the north, where it's colder, uh, there would not be as much uh, water vapor in the air. But... The troposphere in general, 78% nitrogen, nearly 21% oxygen, and then the rest. And you can see on the graphic, water vapor can be anywhere from 1% to 4% depending on location, which slightly changes the overall percentages. One of the more important processes that we look at is adiabatic heating and cooling. When you take a look at the graphic here, you can see at ground level, we have a 30 degree parcel of air. As that air rises, now rising air is low pressure. As that air rises, it expands and cools. You're not adding heat energy, but you're changing the temperature due to expansion. This is what happens when clouds form, a low pressure system, how storms form. Rising air causes the air to cool. Cool air can hold less water vapor, so clouds would form and eventually we'd have precipitation. If it's sinking, and this image shows you sinking as well, if you're forcing the air down, that's known as high pressure. And this downward forcing of air compresses the air, causing it to warm up, more molecular collisions, warmer air. Warmer air can hold more water vapor, but you're not adding water vapor, so it's a dry air. So a high pressure system is dry air, clear weather. So these adiabatic processes, high and low pressure, bring us clear weather with the high pressure system, stormy weather with a low pressure system, wind flows from high pressure to low pressure, so these pressure differences also bring us our wind patterns. So this adiabatic process is one of the more important concepts to get in atmospheric science. Now, what causes these pressure differences, these temperature differences, and really the seasons, our climate, we're really insulation. Insulation is uh, science speak for incoming solar radiation. Now that paired with Earth's curvature means when the sun is directly overhead like it is at the equator, you have stronger as far as energy goes, uh, stronger sunlight 
than if you are near the poles. You can see on the graphic near the poles, the light is more diffuse and there's more reflection because it's coming in at an angle. We call that indirect sunlight, indirect insulation. Whereas at the equator, it's coming in at that 90 degree angle, less reflection, and the rays are stronger. So that is direct sunlight. That gives us differential climate zones, uneven heating of the earth. That uneven heating of the earth causes air to rise, low pressure. As it cools in the upper atmosphere, it sinks, high pressure, and it basically drives the seasons, the angle, the angle and going around the sun. We call the angle of Earth's axial tilt the obliquity. So this, uh, we got the seasons, we got climate zones, we have global winds, all these are tied together. So energy transfer, we have a greater energy coming in at the equator less energy coming toward the poles, wind and o subsequently ocean currents then distribute this heat over our planet. So the uneven heating of our planet governs global circulation, the flow of energy. The Coriolis effect is Earth rotating underneath the wind, underneath this water flow, causing it to travel toward the right in the northern hemisphere, toward the left in the southern hemisphere. Wind, therefore, has curved paths. Ocean currents have curved paths. And this is due to the Coriolis effect. The uneven heating and Earth's obliquity causes the four seasons on our planet. At the equator, we're getting the most direct sunlight, so we don't have much seasonal variance. As you move away from the equator, you get more and more seasonal variance until you get toward the poles where you always have indirect sunlight and you have less seasonal variance there as well. You can see Earth's trip around the sun, the axial tilt does not change, but the part of the Earth leaning toward the sun changes. Take a look at the summer solstice. Northern hemisphere, summer, southern hemisphere, winter. You can see the northern hemisphere is leaning toward the sun, getting more direct sunlight, that gives us longer days, warmer days. On the equinoxes, autumnal and vernal, the whole planet gets 12 hours daylight, 12 hours darkness. It's even. During the winter solstice, notice the northern hemisphere is leaning away from the sun, shorter days, less direct sunlight, more indirect sunlight. So this is what causes the seasons on our planet. The length of day varies seasonally. During the winter, we have in the Northern Hemisphere, shorter days. You can see more of our planet is in the darkness in the Northern Hemisphere than in the light. Earth spins 15 degrees per hour. So we have less time with the sun in the sky in the winter. In the summer, more of the Earth is in the lit part of uh, the planet, and you can see days are longer, more direct sunlight. So length of days or daylight varies seasonally due to this axial tilt and Earth's trip around the sun as well. Any fluid, and a fluid is something that can flow, any fluid, be it water, be it air, be it 
Earth's mantle, any fluid, energy circulation is caused by convection. Convection is this current where it is warmer and it rises and then it cools and it sinks and it causes these convection cells. These convection cells then transfer heat. So it's how wind and it's how ocean, it's how mantle moves, lithospheric plates, convection, it's energy transfer in a fluid due to density differences caused by temperature differences in this case. The Coriolis effect we mentioned was first described by Gaspert de Coriolis, hence the name, and the earth is spinning underneath this movement causing deflection. So in the northern hemisphere, air turns to the right. In the southern hemisphere, air turns to the left. Around high pressure systems, high pressure systems, air turning to the right means the flow is clockwise. Around low pressure systems, air turning to the right means it's counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. Incidentally, ocean currents center around areas of high pressure. So these gyras, these spinning ocean currents, if you picture a giant slow moving whirlpool, that would be a gyra in the oceans, they move clockwise in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. They move counterclockwise. Now, around a low pressure system, the spin around a hurricane, that is a counterclockwise spin because it's around low pressure in the northern hemisphere. So, Coriolis effect causes this rotational flow around the center. This is our global circulation patterns of our atmosphere, which drives ocean currents, so they go hand in hand. If you look along the equator, you see the ITCZ doldrums, equatorial trough, low pressure belt. Let's describe that. The air is rising over the equator. This rising air is indicative of low pressure. So that low pressure belt on the equator, that rising air, leads to rainforests, a lot of rain, rising air, low pressure. In the summer, when the northern hemisphere tilted a little to it, the, the uh, rising air gets caught in these trade winds, and that's where hurricanes are born. But we have this rising air. That's why there's rainforests. That's why the equator is known as wet. That rising air reaches the upper atmosphere, cools, and descends. That tropical cell is called the Hadley cell. It gives rise on the surface to the trade winds. Okay, so those trade winds are blowing across the Atlantic from zero degrees the equator to approximately 30 degrees. It changes seasonally due to the Earth's tilt, so this would be the average. You can see right along that 30 degrees, you have your descending air. That would be a high pressure belt. It's called the subtropical high pressure belt. That is high pressure, clear, dry air. So uh, many of the world's deserts lie along this degree, the subtropical high pressure belt. The same in the Southern hemisphere. So we have drier. We mentioned last lecture how salinity is less at the equator due to increased precipitation, more along these tropics due to increased evaporation. Now you can see weather-wise how that happens. Now across most of North America, we have these westerlies blowing, this mid-latitude cell, the feral cell, the westerlies. 
So weather systems tend to move across the United States from west to east. Winds are named from the direction that they come from, not the direction that they're going. Then we have the polar cells near the uh, North and South Pole. Now these seams, these pressure belts, also contain jet streams. The polar jet stream is drawn in this image and the subtropical high pressure belts are really subtropical jet streams as well. So the doldrums, the doldrums along the equator don't get much wind. Okay, low pressure, warm air is rising, not much wind. Then you can see the northeast trade winds and the southeast trade winds, those push equatorial currents. So the water flow is in the direction of this. The westerlies actually push our Gulf Stream and along the Atlantic. So these move weather patterns, they cause um, ocean currents to move. Remember, heat is flowing from the equator toward the poles, global heat distribution. Our cells, our cells, the Hadley, the Farrell, and the polar cells, global wind patterns. There's six cells, three in the Northern Hemisphere, three in the Southern Hemisphere. Just a quick summary of each wind type, the doldrums near the equator, they are low pressure, a lot of clouds, a lot of rain. They can be narrowed to wide, depending on the season. There's not much wind there, so early explorers, if they got caught in these doldrums, often would be stranded because no wind in the sails. The trade winds, the trade winds are the tropical wind belts. The horse latitudes are where the subtropical high pressure system is. There's a little bit of um, less wind at these transition areas. Uh, the horse latitudes are named such traditionally uh, because things needed to be thrown overboard if you got stuck in these low wind areas to get the sails a little higher in the atmosphere. Uh, they wouldn't throw cannons overboard because they needed the protection. Uh, the first thing that would go would be the horses. I wasn't there, but that's what I've read. That's how they got their name, the horse latitudes. Either way, it's that uh, subtropical jet stream or high pressure belt. Then the westerlies, then you have another jet stream, and then the easterlies. Monsoons, monsoons in America, we use the term improperly when it's really a bad storm outside. A lot of times uh, we say, whoa, it's a monsoon. But a monsoon is actually a pattern of wind circulation that's seasonal. And there's two monsoons. There's a summer monsoon and a winter monsoon. And it lies along this whole global wind ITCZ movement seasonally. If you look in January here in India, the ITCZ is sitting in the Southern Hemisphere because of that axial tilt. So all this cold, bitter cold, dry air is being sucked from the Himalayas down into India and it's very, very dry and very, very cold. In the summer, when the axial tilt is shifted, this ITCZ moves up to the Himalayas and this warm, moist water sucked from the Indian Ocean and drenches India. So you have almost 10 meters of rain in the rainy season. That's an immense amount of rain. You have zero rain and bitter cold during the winter season. So a monsoon is a seasonal pattern drastic drastic changes not just a big rainstorm the summer monsoons are rain the winter monsoons are bitter cold and dry 
So we use the term a little bit wrong in, in, in America. Uh, it's really a seasonal shift, a monsoon. We have daily shifts here on the west coast of Florida. You can see the sea breeze all day. That land is warming up. Air's rising over that land, pulling moist water from the Gulf. In the afternoon, these tall clouds have built up, and we have our afternoon thunder storms all along the coast here in Florida. That's our typical weather pattern between the sea breeze and then the land breeze where that air returns in the evening. So this is not a seasonal monsoon uh, like they have in India from a wet to dry season, but it's a daily shift from hot, humid days to that afternoon thunderstorm to cooler, drier nights, and then it shifts back the next day, and the wind pattern shifts back and forth. Now we mentioned low pressure systems are storms. We call them cyclones in the Northern hemisphere. This is a uh, extreme example of a low pressure system. Uh, and remember the winds rotate counterclockwise around the low. Now thunderstorms, thunder and lightning, common here, Pinellas County, that's where I live. If you're watching this around St. Petersburg College, you're familiar with Pinellas County. Uh, we've been called the lightning capital of the world. And, you know, we tend to exaggerate. Everything's the capital. Uh, Largo, Key Largo is the uh, diving capital of the world. And Isla Mirada is the fishing capital of the world. And, you know, we like to be the capital of the world all the time. But we are one of the top five lightning places there are. And that's because... That rising air, that rising air, that low pressure. Every afternoon, we have huge amounts of rising air, and the ions are being pulled with it, leading to lightning, and then thunder, of course, the sound uh, of lightning. Uh, so you need strong low pressure, rising air, moist rising air, pulling up these charges, and then the charges are discharged as lightning and thunder. We also are not strangers to tropical storms, hurricanes, tropical depressions, all types of cyclones, low pressure systems. Notice that counterclockwise flow around the eye and it's moving on the trade winds and then it makes a turn. Those of us who live in Florida, we know the low pressure builds up over the water gets lower, gets lower because that rising moist air, it's spinning counterclockwise around the low. It's riding the trade winds, equatorial current until it makes that turn, till it comes around Florida and catches those westerlies. And then it makes that turn up and makes landfall. So those tropical cyclones that we all know and don't love in this area, follow these global wind patterns and these ocean currents, and they're caused by rising air. So notice counterclockwise flow around rising low pressure, and then it's powering itself because the air is rising and rising and rising over the warm water, and the water continues to warm until it makes landfall and then that cyclonic flow is broken. Again, around a low pressure counterclockwise. This is the Beaufort wind scale, the higher end of it, uh, showing you the tropical depression, tropical storm, hurricane development, and then the categories of the hurricane. Notice hurricanes and typhoons, they breed between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. They ride those equatorial currents on the trade winds until they make that turn. The westerlies cause it to turn. When they make landfall, they die. 
and here is a storm path, a typical storm path that we witness here in Florida. So hurricanes and typhoons develop in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise rotation in the southern hemisphere, clockwise rotation. They're referred to as a typhoon with clockwise rotation and a hurricane with counterclockwise rotation. This is what they look Oh, Now, a, 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 a uh, mid-latitude cyclone, mid-latitude cyclone, okay? This is your mid-latitude cyclone. It's a low-pressure system. It's not in the tropics. It's in the mid-latitude, so they develop between the 30 and 60 uh, latitude lines. They develop in a similar fashion. Uh, they look like a comma on the Doppler radar where you have your warm front, and then your cold front, and they are counterclockwise, but they ride the westerly, so they're not moving across the Atlantic towards the United States. They're moving across the United States toward the Atlantic, because they're riding those westerly winds. And this is the main weather maker in the United States, these mid-latitude cyclones, because the United States is in the mid-latitudes. So uh, just like here in Florida, we concentrate on the hurricanes. Uh, in most of the United States, north of Florida, uh, the mid-latitude cyclones govern weather. Now, when we move to the ocean itself, these global wind patterns are what drive surface ocean currents. So here's an image of the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is being pushed by our, across this way we have our equatorial currents, and then it moves, catches the westerlies, and rotates back, and that's the Gulf Stream. Notice toward the north of this image, you have cooler water. In the summer, it's rather high, and in the winter, it pushes down, and this causes nor'easters. This is called the Labrador Current, and it fights with the Gulf Stream. Most surface currents are steered by the trade winds and the westerlies. Ocean currents transfer the heat because, remember, water has that high specific heat from tropical to polar regions. They influence weather and climate. They distribute nutrients. Plankton ride the currents, so they distribute organisms. And then animals need to time their migration with these ocean currents. Because we rotate clockwise around these high pressure systems in our ocean basins, we have circular gyras. Our currents spin in circular gyras. They're driven by the winds, the uneven heating of the earth, and steered by Coriolis effect, the um, earth's rotational effect. We'll concentrate on the North Atlantic gyra right now. Okay, the North equatorial current is moved by the trade winds. The Gulf Stream is where we have that turn. The North Atlantic current and the Canary current those four currents make up the North Atlantic gyra. In the middle of the North Atlantic gyra, we refer to that as the Sargasso Sea, all right? Remember, a sea is a partially isolated body of water. Sargasm is a brown algae that grows in these areas, uh, Gulf, warm Atlantic. It gets ripped up in storms forms floating mats. It's the weed line. It's commonly called the weed line. And uh, mats of this can be found floating in the North Atlantic gyra. And that's how it got its nickname, the Sargasso Sea. Here is the ocean currents 
in the world. Let's take a look at the North Atlantic Gyro. You can see the North Atlantic Gyro flowing from the equator, the Gulf Stream, those are warm currents, flowing from the poles down, the Canary Currents, a cool current. The East Coast of all continents, because of this clockwise, counterclockwise flow, clockwise in the northern, counter in the southern, get warm currents. The West Coast get cool currents. This leads to mangroves in the tropics on the east coast, coral reefs, and on the west coast it leads to kelp forests because kelp's a cold water species. So the distribution of life and also temperature. It's cooler on the west coast of uh, America than it is on the east coast because of the California current. You look at the west coast in the North Pacific gyra, the California current is bringing cold water. So uh, study this map, uh, get to know your major gyras, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific, Indian Ocean, and then in the Gulf of Mexico, that warm current pushing is called the loop current. Uh, if you take a look at the West Coast, you can see that Peru current, that's a cool current that pushing up from Antarctic area toward the equator. Um, when that is interrupted, that's an El Nino. What happens is all that water flows across the Pacific Ocean, builds a little bit up on the uh, toward Asia, and then pushes back. Okay, like um, if you push water uh, in, a, in your tub, toward one end, it kind of sloshes back periodically. And that slosh back slows down the Peru current and allows that west coast of South America to get a little more warm water, doesn't uh, get as much cool water. Now that warm water slosh back is El Nino. Warm water does not hold as much nutrients, so the fish, the anchovy industry struggles. Uh, when you look over at Asia, because that current's interrupted, there's more drought conditions on that side because that warm, moist water is not being pumped across the ocean as well. The trade winds slacken a little bit. So that slosh back of El Nino, called the Southern Oscillation, uh, affects distribution of organisms, affects climate, and ultimately affects the economy, and the health and well-being of people. The Gulf, like we mentioned, has the loop current in it, okay, that enters and exits the Gulf. Uh, the Gulf Stream is a warm current on the east coast of North America. The Labrador current, we mentioned, pushes back especially in the winter from the Arctic. The Canary Current returns cool water down the west coast of Africa, closing the North Atlantic Gyra. The equatorial currents driven by the trade winds on either side of the equator. On the west coast of America, we have the California current, a cool current. Because of this, we have cooler temperatures in Northern California. We have kelp forests, the giant kelp forests of California. The west wind drift is the only circumpolar core, uh, current that goes in, around the entire world partially isolating Antarctica, meaning that the southern hemisphere is cooler and more isolated than the northern hemisphere. On the west coast of countries, we have western boundary currents. They are cold, or, sorry, on the east coast of countries, we have western boundary currents. If you go from the center of the gyra, on the west side of that, uh, those are the warm currents and they are on the east coast of countries. 
even I got a little confused when I was uh, reading uh, my script to you. Uh, Western boundary currents are on the east coast of countries. That's where you can get confused because you go from that high pressure system in the center of the gyra and the eastern side of that, you have the west coast of countries. On the western side of that, you have the east coast of countries. Uh, western boundary currents are warm. Eastern boundary currents are cool. This map will show you that. There's your high pressure. If you move west of your high pressure, here you have your warm currents. If you move east of your high pressure, there you have your cool currents. So these gyras center around high pressure systems. These high pressure systems are at approximately 30 degrees latitude. And they govern world climate as far as pumping warm water toward the poles, moderating climate, pumping cool water back toward the equator, moderating climate. Localized Ekman spirals can spin off mini whirlpools, if you will. Longshore currents uh, are coastal processes. Uh, as waves come in, they come from a general direction, usually the direction from the prevailing winds, and they erode or push your beach in that direction, and that's called longshore currents. Localized rip currents are dangerous return flows. The, if there's a low pressure system in the Gulf, wave action picks up, rip currents can be very dangerous. Pull someone out to sea and cause them to drown. Uh, in the North Atlantic, there's a little hill of water. It's offset to the west, and that's because of Coriolis effect and global winds. And so there's sea levels not level. Sea levels not level. It follows air pressure as well. Uh, where the Labrador current mixes with the Gulf Stream, this little border causes turbulence. These turbulence we call eddies, and they can break off of the Gulf Stream and spin off. If it's uh, in the southern part of the Gulf Stream, uh, it's a cool whirlpool. And if it's uh, in the northern, it's a little warmer water. Upwelling, very important upwelling. The upwelling is water being drawn from the bottom, usually from wind pushing water away from the shore, pulling water up. Upwelling is cool, nutrient-rich, oxygen-plentiful water being pulled up. Upwelling areas are very productive, very ecologically productive. Downwelling areas, because of the general wind patterns or water flow, pushing nutrient-rich water deep, these are not productive. They're barren uh, biologically. During the wind, during a strong wind, you get little stripes, little convergent zones, stripes across the surface of the water. And this uh, debris, these debris lines are areas where the water's converging because of wind blowing it. We did mention El Nino and La Nina. You can see the El Nino, the first image, the Equatorial current is interrupted, so the rain falls offshore and it's dry in Indonesia. You also have downwelling where your Peru anchovy industry would be, causing nutrient poor warm water, and it causes failed fishing and drought. Whereas normal conditions, non El Nino, you can see how the trade winds flow uninterrupted across the entire ocean. It's warm and moist in Asia, you have cool upwelling conditions in South America, and the Peruvian anchovy industry, the rice crops in Asia, they are bountiful. So El Nino, this disruption in the trade winds, equatorial current, and it's cyclical, it happens every seven to 10 years, it's called the Southern Oscillation. It's when that water kind of sloshes back, uh, cause uh, 
economic downturn and starvation and drought. Last lesson, we talked about ocean layers. So in keeping with ocean currents, we'll just mention thermal haline circulation. We talked about the water uh, layers and went in depth about the thermocline, pycnocline. So just as a quick review, surface currents are windblown. Deep water currents are thermal haline circulation. And we've covered these ocean currents already. Uh, the lower portion of our water, the Antarctic, bottom water, the North Atlantic deep water, and then the uh, Antarctic intermediate water all run about four degrees Celsius or so. Uh, water's maximum density, 3.5 salinity. Uh, you can see this uh, depiction here in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and then even the uh, Indian Ocean, you have your water masses. Deep water circulation in the Atlantic Ocean, you can see most of the deep, deep water is from Antarctica and then North Atlantic deep water on top of that. Uh, the intermediate water doesn't mix that much. You have a little bit of um, Mediterranean input, very little because of the Strait of Gibraltar being so narrow. And then the surface zone, uh, the surface zone. These water movements, the thermal haline circulation, leads to an ocean conveyor belt that we discussed as well. So that's a review of deep water currents and an introduction and discussion on surface currents, the two types of ocean currents that we learned, and atmospheric currents, which drive surface currents. We also related that to climate and how heat is uh, distributed by ocean circulation. Now we must move to waves and tides. Just as Energy is transferred in a fluid by convection. Energy can be transferred by waves. In water waves, it's just a circular orbital and there's no net movement. So uh, an open ocean wave can move by and if whatever's floating on the ocean takes this circular pattern and winds up in the same spot it was before. So there's no net movement. Even the largest tsunami in the open ocean causes no damage. The parts of a wave, the top of the wave is called the tress, or the crest. The lowest uh, portion of the wave is called the trough. The amplitude is how high the wave is above resting area. Baseline's the resting area. You can have positive amplitude or negative amplitude. Wavelength is the distance between two waves. The frequency is how many waves pass every second. The period is how long a wave takes to pass by. So wavelength, frequency, period, they all are properties of waves that we need to be familiar with. The three types of wave, the wind wave, and you can see the wind waves, they have a period of somewhere, you know, you're averaging at the highest point, you're averaging about 10 waves per second. But you, you know, you can have a wave per second, a wave every 30 seconds, uh, wind waves. They're the most common wave. Earthquake waves, earthquake waves are seismic sea waves, tsunamis, and you can see they run about a wave every five to 10 minutes. Now, storms only give you a half a wave, we call that a storm surge. 
we'll touch upon that as well. Tides, tidal waves caused by the gravity of the sun and the moon, and there's two distinct wave periods, 12 hours and 24 hours. The 12 hour period is called semi-diurnal, semi-half diurnal day. The 24 hour period is called diurnal. The speed of a wave is measured in distance over time, all speed is. So in wave, it's wavelength over period. Wavelength is how long a wave is, the period is how fast a wave is, distance over time. Another way to express it is distance times frequency. So if you know the frequency of a wave, multiply it by the wavelength, you have how fast it's moving. If you have the uh, period of a wave, wavelength divided by period, how fast it's moving. Waves interact. When they are on phase, they can build each other up. When they're off of phase, they can cancel each other off. Areas where waves interact tend to be more turbulent, less predictable. We call that interference. Destructive interference is canceling each other off. Constructive interference is adding each other up. And these turbulent areas often lead to rogue waves where you have unpredictable wave heights causing damage. So this little uh, graphic shows you building waves up in constructive interference or breaking waves down as in destructive interference. Waves tend to bend towards shallow areas due to bottom interference and bend away from deeper areas so you're having in the shallow areas more erosion and in the deeper areas more deposition they tend to bend around islands we call that diffraction and of course the refraction and return flow. Here you have wave reflection and that rip current uh, depicted in that image. Waves only interact to half the wavelength and depth. That's an important number, one half of the wavelength. If you go below that, you have no interaction. So uh, as a wave approaches shore, it's rolling along nicely, orbital pattern. When you get to a depth of half the wavelength, the front end of the wave interacts with the sea bottom, slowing it down. The back half of the wave then catches up and it topples when that's what white caps are, that toppling uh, of the wave. So half of the wavelength, that is the important number to remember as far as bottom interference goes. Circular patterns until then. Wind energy is the number one cause of waves. Then tides are caused by gravity. Seismic waves or tsunamis are uh, caused by uh, earthquakes, landslides, meteorite impact, along those lines when you look at a wind wave how strong the wind is how long the wind is blowing and the distance the wind has to build up uh force is the three factors that determine wave power strength duration fetch this is the buford scale and i alluded to that when we we're talking about storms the complete Buford scale is wind speed in miles per hour or knots. Remember, nautical miles, knots, when we talked about uh, cartography. And the description and the effects. See, like glass, you have small capillary waves. And that's as good as it gets right there. Uh, surface tension causes little ripples, maybe a breath of air. That is capillary waves. 
Swells are when a wave impacts a seawall or the coastline before it breaks. You have to have a deep trough for a swell to occur. Waves generally break and they start to break at half the wavelength. So waves get crowded because of bottom interference and then the rear waves topple over the front waves causing a surf zone, causing white caps and breakers. Spilling breakers are what we normally get, just a regular spilling, low key waves breaking all at the same area due to a steady wind. Plunging breakers are violent and you would have deep water, strong wind, and you get that air filled tube. These occur Hawaii, Australia, Pacific Ocean, where you have very little continental shelf. That's the surfboard flipping people over on these plunging breakers. Surging breakers are the strongest and they can strip a beach. Shoaling is when waves break off shore due to bottom structure like a sandbar. Interestingly, shoaling also refers to fish schooling. It's called a shoal of fish. And a group of islands sometimes can be called shoals as well. So there's various, uh, you know, shoals can, can have many different meanings. The storm surge is half a wave associated with a low pressure system. Here in Florida, that's what we get. We get the storm surges and our local surfers love these storms coming in because it causes uh, waves that are abnormally large because we don't have a deep bottom so we don't get these plunging and surging breakers. A sesh is a wave confined in a basin. Now tides are a special kind of wave caused by the sun and the moon's gravity. Moon far more influenced than the sun's gravity. This is Mont Saint Michel in France and you can see how extreme the tides affect this island slash peninsula. The earth has two tidal bulges, one caused by the gravity of the moon, one caused by inertia. The law of inertia states a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. So what happens is you have one tide caused by gravity and on the opposite end of the world, you have another tidal bulge that's called the inertial bulge. The Earth wobbles in its orbit because the moon's going around uh, and our center of gravity is slightly off center. Also, uh, planets, moons, satellites stay in orbit because of the law of inertia. Uh, gravity would pull us into the sun, but because we tend to stay in motion, the two vectors counteract each other. You can see this one would shoot us off into space. This one would pull us into uh, the sun, but when you combine them, you get a rotation. So planets orbit the sun in balance between gravity and inertia. Our telecommunication satellites orbit the Earth due to gravity and inertia, and we have two tides due to gravity and inertia. We wobble in our orbit, like I said, because our center of gravity is not the center of our planet, because we are part of an Earth-Moon system. Tidal bulges form around our center of mass. The gravitational tide may be slightly higher than the inertial tide. There's our center of mass, not quite the center of our planet. And we have the gravitational tide, the inertial tide, and the combined effect of two tidal bulges around our planet. Now, because the Earth is spinning, a day is 24 hours, but the moon is revolving around us, so the tidal day is 24 hours and 50 minutes because the moon has moved a little bit 
in one of our rotations. So tides are not symmetrical with day, days. Moonrise is not symmetrical with days and nights. That's why you can see the moon in the afternoon sometimes. You can see the moon in the evening sometimes because they're out of sync. So a tidal cycle is 24 hours and 50 minutes. Which means if we have a semi-diurnal tide, semi-diurnal tide would be two highs and two lows a day. You would have a high and a low in 12 hours, 25 minutes would be one high-low. And then the next 12 hours, 25 minutes, one high-low again. So 24 hours, 50 minutes is a tidal day. So a lunar day, 24 hours, 50 minutes, a solar day, 24 hours, and they do not sync up. We mentioned the semi-diurnal and diurnal, and then you have mixed tides. Now a semi-diurnal is two highs and two lows every day, and they're approximately the same height. Diurnal, one high and one low a day. Mixed Usually you have two highs and two lows, but they're in different heights. And that tends to break down toward uh, quarter moons. And we'll take a look at these tidal patterns in a moment. Amphidromic are nodes in the center of the ocean basins. So semi-diurnal, semi-diurnal means twice a day. Diurnal means once a day. Mixed usually twice a day but there are noticeably different heights so here this is what i mean mixed look at there's your high there's your low 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 different heights uh you can see in red so all these are areas of mixed tides that's us right there west coast of florida mixed tide Diurnal, one high, one low every day, one high, one low, diurnal. Semi-diurnal, relatively even heights, semi-diurnal. So those are our tidal patterns. Mixed, where we live, diurnal, semi-diurnal. This I pulled from the internet. It's just a St. Petersburg mixed tide. Two highs, two lows every tidal day different heights. The sun now has its influence as well. When the sun and the moon are on plane, you have very high bulges, very low nodes. We call that a spring tide. When we're at the quarter, you have moderate bulges, moderate lows. We call that a neap tide. So, Lunar phases and tidal height go hand in hand. Spring tides every 14 days, new full moon, neap tides every 14 days, first quarter, last quarter. You get a pattern like this. Here's your spring tides. Notice how high these tidal swings are. Your neaps, low. Full moon or new moon, quarter moon, full moon, quarter moon, moving right along you get these oscillations of tidal height. Also notice on this mixed tide, during the neap phase, it breaks down and you don't always have two distinct tides. So that's your mixed, mixed. This is your non-mixed. Notice here, you have high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, very nice and neat. Around here, you have, is still, High, low, high, low. So you're still getting that semi-diurnal, uh, but it's far more moderate. Next, you have a breakdown. The last type of waves are the tsunamis, the seismic sea waves. They are generated by landslides, icebergs, volcanic earthquakes, asteroid impacts, things along those lines. You have to have deep water for them to really impact shore because they have a very long wavelength. When they enter shallow water, 
that wavelength can turn into a hundred foot amplitude or more. Uh, they have destroyed civilization. The Manoa civilization was wiped out by tsunamis. So a regular wave can have a 10 foot for a really large wave, but a tsunami can have 100 plus feet when it enters shallow water. Notice how large the wavelength is in deep water. It can be miles and only a foot or two in amplitude. So when you're over your open ocean, super long waves. When you're in shallow water, super high waves. We have this whole tsunami system, 26 nation, along the Ring of Fire and in Indonesia, uh, using satellite technology to monitor for tsunamis because the only way to escape is alarm, move to high ground. Uh, buoys measure oceanic pressure changes because if you remember from that little graphic, uh, gosh, you can have two foot amplitude. You can't really measure that as accurately as you can from, from spaces you can from these buoys. Uh, so the buoys are strategically located around the world to check for these uh, waves, significant uh, high and periods. The last thing that we are looking at is coastal processes. So the coast is where the land and the water meet. That, that, that seems fairly obvious. Submergent and emergent coastlines. An emergent coastline is experiencing uplift, a fallen sea level or uplift. So usually we have our subduction causing coastal mountains to be uplifted, or we have that hot spot causing an island to form uplift. Submergent coastlines are more common now with the sea level rising. Uh, you can also have local subsidence. When you look at a rocky coastline, you tend to get erosion like this and then sea cliffs. And when you have a sandy coastline, you tend to have erosion like that, uh, discordant with beaches and points. Now, sea level has been rising for the past 18,000 years or so. Uh, it was rapid at first and then leveled off and now it's picked up again. So when you look at the data, you can see sea level has rose real fast as the ice age ended and then steadily leveled off until the industrial revolution. And now we're having a little pickup. If we were to project it, you can see, much like the spaghetti model on uh, hurricanes, you can see much disagreement in how much our sea level is going to rise in the future. We do know that Florida, we are very at risk for sea level changes. During the peak of the last ice age, the Florida platform, the land, was two-thirds larger than it is today. If we lose Greenland, we could wind up with the Florida platform being this, looking like this. Coastal erosion is something we're always fighting. We talked about longshore currents and rip currents and how they move our uh, coastal regions, especially be Waves tend to bend towards shallow water, deposit on the deeper water, so you get your beach deposition and your headland erosion. High energy beaches have a lot of wave action. They tend to have large rocks, not really powdery sand, coarse. Low energy beaches can be anything from fine sand to mud just because there's less wave action to wash away these sediments. Beaches are depositional landforms, generally of sand, that's a size, but you can have high energy beaches, gravel, pebbles, 
for Long Energy beaches can be muddy. They do take a certain structure, though. You generally have where your waves cut these longshore bars, surf zone. Then you have a four beach. The four beach is influenced by the tides, wet sand, a berm, and then the back beach is dry. And then the dunes behind there uh, are held together by vegetation and wind helps form them. So we call that a beach profile. The beaches are eroded by longshore transport. As the waves come in, they push our beach in the direction of the longshore current. This leads to the formation of barrier islands, spits, bay mouth bars, and sandbars. All these are typical landforms on depositional coasts. On a barrier island, now the Atlantic Ocean Gulf Coast, the barrier islands that we have formed at the end of the last ice age, they're depositional. The, and you can see here, here's the Gulf or the high energy side Atlantic, sandy, and then you have your finer sediments behind it, mud. Here in Florida, we have beach, maritime forest, mangrove, or salt marsh. So, uh, the ocean side or gulf side tends to be beach and then the behind it tends to be sediments where plants can grow salt marsh mangrove then you have the intracoastals and then the continent so our beaches are on the ocean or gulf side and then our mangroves or salt marshes are on the estuary side they're called bar built estuaries we refer to them locally as intracoastal. Other places call them lagoons. So basically, we study, in one of our virtual field trips, we're studying this beach, scrub, or dune, scrub, maritime forest, scrub, mangrove, or salt marsh, depending on your location, intracoastals. That is the cross section of the barrier island. We have an extensive field trip, virtual field trips covering our barrier islands. Darwin also, not only did he contribute natural selection, but he contributed atoll formation. And these are how reefs form. You can see this is a circular reef, an atoll, and it forms from, here's your volcano, in a warm water area and the reef goes there as the volcano becomes extinct and subsides the reef continues to grow leaving behind an atoll an estuary is where fresh water and salt water mix there's four major estuaries riverine drowned river okay that's the most obvious hudson river nile river mississippi river meets the sea, drowned river. A fjord, these are old glacial valleys that have filled up with water due to the end of the ice age, okay? Fjord, less common. Bar built, we talked about that here in Florida, our barrier islands, and then that intracoastal lagoon. And a tectonic, uh, like Puget Sound, San Francisco Bay, these are common along the ring of fire, tectonic estuary. Here's an image of a drowned river. This would be Charleston, South Carolina. Here's an image of a fjord, common in Scandinavia, common in uh, Northeast United States, where the Ice Age had great impact. Here's a bar built, that's Florida. The Eastern seaboard has uh, sandbars, Gulf Coast and tectonic along the ring of fire. Any estuary, you have to have interaction between salt and fresh water. They don't mix very well, so you get this salt water wedge. High tide, it pushes up. Low tide, it recedes. 
So organisms that live in these estuaries have to deal with salinity changes, temperature changes, currents. Uh, so it's very all estuaries, and 80% of ocean species breed in the estuaries. So they're considered nurseries of the sea. They're so very important economically. They're so very important biologically, but they have variable salinity and temperatures. We're always fighting erosion. We build groins, seawalls, and we have to import sand and re-nourish our beaches. Here in Florida, our whole economy centers around beaches. We have a tourist economy. In this image, you can see we have a pier, we have a uh, wall out here, and because, look, the sand's building up, so the longshore current is moving in this direction, building the sand up, the currents are being impacted by this pier, and this is how we prevent beach erosion, groins. Here, groins are preventing beach erosion. So, uh, we spend a great deal of time, a great deal of energy uh, fighting beach erosion and re-nourishing these beaches. This brings our day to an end. I hope you enjoyed this module. I look forward to continuing with the next module. Have a great day, everybody.